Bill had two time pastors, and then he got past and Bill said, and we're going into the outreach tonight. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, maybe you will. But uh, yeah, the Callahans are doing a great job. They have a 500 people tent out there. Um, Tom got to go uh, Friday night. And, uh, you know, I just looked around and I was thinking how many ministries we have here that we're serving, whether it's in the Army with Chaplain uh, Tony or the Callahans with the Evangelist and Kenneth C and C Ministry. Uh, Chris is the one who walks around carrying the cross in the streets. And Paula um, Rivo, Paula Rivo, I say it wrong. Paula Rivo. You, you say. The one who kills the coyotes, that's him. <laughs> Uh, or not, <laughs> but he found a really neat truck. Oh, I got to preach today. I'll, I'll go back to I love that truck. And uh, no, we have a lot of ministries, Dawnings, Teen Challenge, and um, I'm really blessed because that's what it's all about, choosing God each day. If you open up your Bibles, uh, if you have them, to John 1. Chapter 1, verse 10 to 14. I believe I put it on the front of the bulletin in case uh, you didn't bring your Bibles. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many has, has received him, to them he gave his power to become the sons of God. Put that in your pocket today, as my husband would say. Even to them that believed on his name, which were, were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We praise you, Lord, that you stand beside us. Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would hear what you have placed on my heart today, Lord. Lord, that we would become the roaring lions that this world needs. Not timid, Lord. Not complacent, Lord. Not, not lethargic, Lord. But roaring lions, because you have given us the power to become the sons and daughters of God. We ask that, Lord, that what comes through my mouth is of you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that it would fall on good soil. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and most importantly, a heart to respond. Yes. We ask this in your Son's name, Jesus, and all God's children said, Amen. I want to share that I got a lot of this stuff from my friend, uh, Pastor um, Terry Sisney. He's a great writer. He was an evangelist for several, several years, and God gave him the church I wanted over in Grover. What is it, Bill? Grover? Grover Beach. Grover <clears throat> Beach. You could walk to the beach from that church. Yeah. And we were here, and it was a hard year for us here, and we drove over there, we heard it was open, and then we stood, and I looked at this parking lot, and I looked to my right, the church was here, and I looked to my right, and I could see the ocean. Yeah. And I saw the big parking lot, I said, wow, my son could park his boat there, his four-wheel drive big thingamajig that he has, and we could go out and have so much fun, because I'm an ocean girl, I was born, in New York, right on the water. Our house literally was on the water. Yeah. Not in the water, on the water. <laughs> but we had boats that were in the water. And I stood there and I said, Oh, Lord, I want this church. You said if we ask that you will give us what our heart desires. And all I heard was, No. <laughs> That was one of those unanswered prayers that I wasn't happy about yeah. because uh, I, mean, I don't like the weather here and we're going to hit the hundreds already on Wednesday. Yeah. And this body wasn't made 
for this kind of weather. Even yet last night as we were saying the vows, the sweat was coming down my face, my glasses were fogging up, this, and I was up there having to repeat, say the vows for our bride, and I'm going, Lord, see, I'm not ready to this. <laughs> But you know, we're going to talk about choose this day. Choose this day. So here's another scripture for you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. Do you understand that? You could say, no, I didn't. Now, when we accepted Jesus Christ into our heart, our spirit person became new. We got everything he is, was, and he came into us. But there was a problem. The rest of us had to get saved. Our mind and our flesh. Now as we look into the scripture and we studied the Bible, we have to recognize some very important things. There is a distinction in the Bible, and it took me a while to really comprehend it, because I asked the Lord, especially in the turbulent times that we're living in, how come things are not changing? How come people aren't getting healed? How come we're not seeing the signs and wonders you promised us, Jesus, that we would see? But I realized, and I went through reading Pastor Terry's book, I realized that there's a couple of different problems here. There's a positional and legal truth. That's one category. And then there's a literally an experiential truth. You know, some of us have not really experienced all that we are legally able to have. But we're going to found out, find out why today. So when you speak of what's positionally legally true, we are speaking of what Jesus did for us, what he's accomplished, and even what was finished. But the issue is, there's a vast difference between the two. What are we expecting and experiencing literally in our lives? You know, it's like when you give your kid a car. It might be your car, but you give him the keys. As a parent of uh, five boys, that was nerve-wracking to me. Um, my beautiful Lincoln Continental went the way, way of the graveyard, because. My son totaled it. From that point on, I said, you guys, buy your own cars. <laughs> but I gave them a key, and they could say, I have a car. I have a car. I have a car. Well, what good is the key if you don't get into the car? What good is the key if you don't turn it on, the ignition? and take it out of park. Yeah. So many of us have these gifts, but we claim we're evangelists, we're healers, we're this and that, but we don't see the fruit because we're not putting anything into action. Yeah. Come on, baby. So let me explain a little bit further who we really are in Christ. What happened that day when you accept the Lord into your heart? Well, what's going to happen today when you do ask him into your heart? Positionally and legally, we are in Christ. Yes. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Lost an earring. See, you don't have that problem. <laughs> the devil is under our feet. We are redeemed of the Lord, we are healed, we are the seed of Abraham. Legally, all the blessings of Abraham belong to us. Yeah. And we have power and authority over all sickness, all disease, 
poverty, lack, and all devils. Yeah, come on, baby. all devils. But to tell the truth, although every one of these things that we have spoken of positionally and legally, the sad truth is not many people are walking in the experience yeah, to on. this degree in life. We're not putting the pedal to the metal. Last week I spoke on how important that we need to renew our minds, that we wash that we need to wash our minds, that we need to saturate our minds with the Word of God and to bring our understanding into alignment with the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done and what He accomplished on our behalf. We have to believe what the Word of God says and stand on that truth. Some of us are so busy reading other books and, and listening to other people, and that's all good. But this is really should be our source. This is what we need to believe. The problem that we have to deal with this, many times we are satisfied with just confessing it. I'm a child of God, we say. In other words, we are satisfied just talking about it, singing about it, and testifying about it. But what is positionally and legally true, but literally we're not experiencing it? You know, because we don't want to pay the cost. Most of God's people are not walking in divine health. Most of the church is not walking in divine prosperity. Most of the God's people, sad to say, are not walking in divine peace and supernatural joy. I was one of those. Last week. You can laugh at that. It's funny. Don't fall asleep by me. Sometimes it's tough being me and doing what God wants us to do. Sometimes we are dragged down. Sometimes we need that supernatural power and, and authority over the devil. All you have to do is look around and look at the church and the body of Christ and you'll see what I'm talking about. We confess that we own these things and that these th things that we have and these are things that we, God has given us, but are we actually using them? Are we standing firm? Do we know what's in that book? And do we really, really believe that it's for us? Yeah. I look at some of the greats, like Patricia King and, and Stacy Campbell and, and some of the greats, David Wilkes, who was in my life about 50 years ago. I look at them, but you know what the difference was between them and me? They went for it. They went for all that they needed and wanted to get. They believed that, yeah, they had their ups and downs, but they pushed and they went forward and they claimed it. The difference between what God says we are and what we are actually manifests and living in our daily experience boil down to one word. Do you want to change? Do you want to change? Or the word we hear a lot of time is transform. A lot of us don't want change. I remember when I was a young mo mother and had a, ha a house in New York, and we, I would change the curtains all with every season. I'd have different curtains, different bed spreads. Yeah. Now, 13 years later, the same drapes are hanging up <laughs> in our are. living room. Yeah. And I'm very happy about that. Uh, yeah, come on, man. As you get older, it's like, huh, do I really want to do that? Yeah. But some people, you know, we were even talking about, you know, possibly getting a new car, and we both said, oh, we like this car. Yeah. Right? Remember, we, we used to have money every three years, we got a new car, <laughs> whether we years. needed it or not. You see, we run into trouble when we expect God to do for us and in us what God has made us responsible for. I'm going to repeat that and hopefully you'll wake up and hear it. We run into trouble when we, ex we expect God to do for us and in us what God has made us responsible for. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to give you alert, folks, something you might not know. 
But God is not going to change you. Come on, try changing your kids. It was great when they had to stay in the playpen, wasn't it? When my kids, my boys, at the night of the, the uh, before they turned 13, I would stare at them. Now by the time number five came along, he knew what I was doing, but the others I would just stare. Mom, stop staring at me. Why are you staring at me? I said, you know what tomorrow is, don't you? He said, yeah, it's my birthday. I said, you know what's going to happen, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be 13. I said, and what else? And they would look at me and I said, I'm staring at you because I want to remember you well, I still loved you, because tomorrow you're going to turn into a teenager, and that's worse than the terrible twos. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me. I can remember being an empty nester, you know. It was so wonderful. I did a happy dance when the last one moved. We had to sell the house and then tell them you have to go find some other place to live because the house is sold. He tried to rent it from someone else. Remember that? The thing was, it was so great to go into the bathroom and not hear, Ma! Ma! And you opened your refrigerator and the leftovers were still there. Because we had sharks, right? Nine headed sharks. Nine headed sharks. But I say that because change sometimes is so hard. All you have to do is look around. In many cases, we all have just done confession. And as I said earlier, there's a vast, large, tremendous, huge difference between who we are positionally and who we can be experientially. And here is what that gap is, that difference, that chasm, that separation between who God says I am, positionally, and who I'm speaking about, literally. God is not going to change you. You see, this is what God makes us responsible for. It's because we, so many times, take things for granted. And we expect God to do for us what God has made us responsible to do for ourselves. There's so many times God has you do something, or he gives you a prophetic word, or you read it in your scriptures, and then you just put it off. Now, now this is not to condemn anybody, but definitely is a word to convict you. I've been there. I'm not pointing fingers, because I know when God said, give up your million, do million dollars, leave your house, leave New York, and give it all away, not to your kids, to other, to other people, and come to California. I was so holy. You know what I did? <laughs> Can I speak to somebody else up there? That couldn't be from God. And then when Bill, we, I went into ministry and Bill got a great job in Tampa, Florida. Oh, I loved it. We lived on an island and we had a house we paid cash for with a pool in the backyard. And we were 35 minutes from Disney, an hour from Daytona, an hour from Tampa. We had a Goldwing motorcycle. That's a whole nother story. Who, whoever gets on a motorcycle? This babe did, because I loved him. Didn't make sense. You, go, you drive in a car that has seat belts and safety glass all around you and then you go on this two-wheel thing and well, that's another story for another day but we had fun lots of fun and for the first time in my life i didn't have to work in the world i was working for teen challenge everything was good and we loved it we loved it we went on and then he said come and that decision was hard for me because I love working for Teen Challenge. I love the church we were in. I loved doing 
what God wanted us to be. What I'm saying is that you have responsibilities in this relationship. It's up to you to change, or we would say, transform. You see, he doesn't want us, as I spoke two weeks ago, about being a worm. He wants us to become the butterflies, so the world can see the difference in us. I believe this is the reason that it's been so heavy on my heart. I see myself and others not walking in all and enjoying the life that the Bible proclaims we should have. The abundant life. Yes. What God talks about, what Pastor just said a little while ago. You see, God gives us his word. He gives us his spirit. He shows us his will and his way. God gives me and you the ability to make choices. These choices and decisions that we make and the actions that we take is what produce changes in our lives. Our God does not change us. He calls us to change. Yes. God empowers us to change, equips us to change, yes, and gives us his spirit. He gave us his word. But the big but is there. God makes you and God makes me responsible for that change. Yeah. He gives us the power to become. The Bible says in Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of this mind. This is God's commandment to you and I. God is saying, be transformed. This is your part. You have to do it. So we need to do it. It's as simple as that. It's the choice. And a lot of you have been there. We need to make each other accountable. We need to challenge each other. Otherwise, we produce lazy Christians and a loose Christianity that says God has taken care of it all, nothing to worry about. Grace is working everything over, everything for me, so I don't have to do anything. I don't have to be concerned about anything, and that's not true. We don't have to worry because we know God will provide for us, but what are we doing? We put out seed for the birds, but the birds have to come and get the seed. The Bible says, therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what's unclean, and I will receive you. And then it says, put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications from your mouth, from Colossians 3.8. It goes on in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, which says, Do not you do not know that the unrighteous do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Yeah. Do not be deceived. Everybody's saying God loves you. Yes, he loves you, but he doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He goes on to say in in Corinthians. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkenness, nor vials, nor explorators will inherit the kingdom of God. We have to realize that we're in a world that's permissive for everything, and that's not our God. That's the God of the world. Do what you feel like. No. That's what got us in trouble. They wanted to eat that fruit. Don't do what you feel like it. If they had stopped eating that, they never ate that fruit, we wouldn't be in this mess. And look what the Bible says in Philippians 2.12. You ready to hear this one? Work out. I think they could put exercise in there. You know how I feel about that for a letter word. But God is saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out. But I had to realize where I was at even a year ago, this doesn't happen automatically. You have to apply yourself. You have to, you must choose to change. Yeah. Last year, I was 107 pounds more walking with the walker, having a hard time breathing. And God, and God said, I want you to participate in your healing. 
Oh, come on, don't we all want to come to the altars like my husband did and get new lungs or get a new this or a new that? No. That's not what always happens. Sometimes God says, I'm sending you to a good doctor. Listen to him. Yeah. And then he says, stop smoking. Stop drinking coffee. Stop overeating. And then you go to another doctor. Because you don't like what that doctor said. <laughs> and they said, they're, and you would tell people, oh, they're very confused. They don't know what's wrong with me. No, they know what's wrong with you. You don't know what's wrong with you. So how do we make this change? I'm glad you asked. We look into the mirror of the Word of God. We see Jesus. Ah, Jesus. Those words from Gethsemane, not my will, but your will, Lord. I've been saying that since I was a little kid in the Lord's Prayer. Oh my gosh, really? I really like my will. It makes sense to me. But God's saying no. Well, other people can do that. Other people, I've I mean, when I was sitting in Florida in my house, I, I said, how come you're not asking my sister across the street to do any of this? How come she can stay in Florida? And he says, I chose you. And we all want to be chosen, don't we? We all want a word from God. We all want to feel good. We want to get the, as my husband calls it, the woos! Until it costs us. And it's like, Ooh. You know, I used to read when I was, uh, how people would come and you go down to the, the faith and how it was so awesome, all these faith people. And then they would say, well, then they were crucified and persecuted and turned upside down, heads taken off. And I said, can't you wait to join this club? It costs to be a Christian. Yeah. It costs Jesus everything. But he's asking us, because according to Jeremiah 29, 11, you know my verse, he has a plan in the future, but it can't come to fruition if we don't participate. Yeah. If we don't participate. Do you want to be rich according to the scriptures? It says we'll be abundant, but can you part with that little dollar or the $20 in your wallet? So many pastors preach that, that the last thing to be saved is a person's wallet. Yeah. Well, how's, why would he give you a million dollars if you can't take care of the 20000 that you have? Yeah. It has to be changed. There has to be accountability. We see Jesus, and then the Word shows us what he looks like. And then he, they show us, the Word shows us what we look like. Through the application of God's word, we begin to take on the image of the Lord Jesus and we become reflections of who he is. Remember, change is a choice. The Holy Spirit is the agent of change. He's there to help you. You don't have to do this by yourself. Right. I was sitting there just less than 15, 20 minutes ago saying, God, I've got nothing left. Where am I going to get excitement? Because I could say, you know, just change first. It's easy. I had to come and have to have purpose and excitement. The excitement I felt when God gave me this. I didn't have it two minutes ago, but God is showing me this is exciting, folks. This is exciting. Because he's going to take us on a journey. We just pray beyond our imagination. We even sang that. Now I want you to say something. Repeat. I choose to change. I choose to change. A little louder. I choose to change. A little louder. I choose to change. Okay, now you got me going. You see, we're going to go back to First John where he says, He made the right authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, that is to those who believe in adhering to, trust in, and rely on his name. 
One of the things I did during COVID was study the Song of Solomon about the Shulamite woman who, who was in love with this guy like we saw yesterday. You know, when, when I watch a wedding, I guess because I'm a mom of boys, everybody's looking at the bride. But I love to watch the groom's face. Yeah. I love to see as his bride comes. Now he knows her, he's been with her, he's talked to her, he's sat across the table from her, and who knows what else they've done in the stage. But when he sees her and knows that in a few steps he's she's going to be his, there's such a sparkle. There's such a sparkle, and that happened yesterday as Travis saw Brittany come down the aisle. Ooh, I get goosebumps. I was so touched that I'm supposed to open up the service. It was my job to open up the service that I said, I'm so emotional, I was crying. Because that's when you know a couple's in love, when they can look in each other's eyes. And I know I still have that, because when I look into Bill Nicolay's eyes, it's still more love than it was when we got knew each other 33 years ago. That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. We should need to fall in love with God, because that's why then when he says change, it's not too difficult. You see, he gives us the power, he says. And that power means ability, authority, privilege. He gives us the power of choice. We see we've got the power, we preach about the power of the Holy Spirit, but in reality, the greatest power we have received from God is the power to become like Jesus. And that Shulamite woman who fell in love with her lover still didn't want to go work with him in his father's vineyard. Yeah. And she sent him away. And you can read about it in the Bible. And then she realized what she did, and it took her a while, because you know what? She was making a choice. She didn't, she knew what that choice was going to cost her. Yeah. And she didn't want to take it. She loved him, but not enough to die herself, because she knew that was the next step. In order to follow him, she'd have to give up the life that she dreamed. She'd have to give up the life of living near her children and being close to her grandchildren. That on holidays that she couldn't go and just celebrate with her family like she did with her grandma. That's what happened to me. I was angry. And these days I still get angry over it. And then I pray. And God changes my heart. We are becomers. We need to become like Jesus. And I remember reading in uh, Brian Simmons' book where he said, you're to be like Jesus. You're to come like Jesus. And I'm like, oh, that's heresy. We shouldn't be saying that. And I even got upset, and I said, that's not right. And I put the book down, and then I started praying about it, and I went, of course we're to be like Jesus. Father God has a son, and he wants his son to marry the bride. And the son cannot be unevenly yoked. So we need to be like the son. That was an eye-opener to me. That was an eye-opener. That couple yesterday had to give over, and that's what was in their vows, to give over. And then her dream became his dream, and his dream became her dream. We just told you she's leaving for the Marines on Tuesday. What a way to have a honeymoon. Kiss and goodbye. They were willing to submit to each other's dreams. We become, we're becoming different. We're becoming something better. We're becoming something greater. We are becoming the person we were created to be in Christ. And we have the power to become it. Yes, we do. I'm learning. Whoever thought I'd be standing here a year ago? Yeah. I could 
even breathe this much. I couldn't stand. My back would be out. My legs would hurt. But the power to become is the power of choice to be the sons and daughters. And that means the power to become like Jesus. And 1 John 4, 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Look at Peter, the fisherman. Look what he became. Even now, especially after he denied Christ. What many saying, I'll fight for you, I'll fight for you, I'll do whatever you need. He slashed off somebody's ear. And then he came, I don't know. I don't know. Hi, I saw you with him. No, not me. We do that. But don't you love what Jesus did? He went to Peter. And what did he say? What were the words he said? Peter, do you love me? You see, it's a love relationship. Willing to get on the back of a motorcycle was a love relationship. My intellect was saying, you're nuts. <laughs> Especially, I sit higher than Bill. And while we were behind the poop truck, it all ended up in my face. <laughs> but I love my husband. And we sold him all the And we sold him all the <laughs> It's impossible to become who God is calling us without change. Yeah. Without change. I had a group of women in the back plus Bill dealing with the abortion issue. Most pastors won't talk about it because it's too political. How can it be political when we have killed 63 million babies? How can we not talk from here? How can we not stand and say it's wrong to teach our kids about racism? To be racist. How can we not stand here and do nothing when they're confusing a child, saying, well, today you're a boy, but tomorrow you can be a girl? totally against what God is doing. We need to vote. And you need to vote God's will. We need to measure people and say, do you believe what my God believes? We're not going to tell you who to vote for. We're going to say, vote your faith. A baby's a baby, no matter how small. Don't tell me. Especially now, in my day, we didn't have an ultrasound. We had to wait till the rabbit died. We had to wait till we were pushing that baby out. First the head, then the shoulders. Then you found out what it was. My Simeon. You're having a girl, you're having a girl, you're having a girl. So I crocheted everything in pink. <laughs> Out came his head. Even the doctor told me, Oh, I told you, look at this little girl. Look at the hair on her head. And then the shoulders came out. And he says, Guess what? Your girl has a penis. <laughs> I said penis, but we Oh, I wasn't in the public. Behave yourself. Behave yourself. <laughs> It's impossible to become without change. There is no change without the renewing of this. You have to believe when your pocketbook is empty and you've been faithful and you've, you've tithed and you've given offerings that God will take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. It took me 16 months to believe that. I'm a woman who had to have 100 something plus in my checking account. And then God said, give everything up and trust me. Well, I had a salary, but when we came here, it was, we have no salary. And we were in arms old enough for Social Security. And for 16 months, it could have happened in one month, but no, it took this mind 
16 months to take all the bills of the church and our personal bills, put it down on the table, Bill and I would put our hands on it and pray. And say, Lord, provide. We trust you for our needs and the church's needs. And the bills with money would come in from all over the United States. Weird places money would show up. He even multiplied money in front of me. And then on, on the last day of the month, we pray together and say, thank you, Jesus. Three words. Three words. Thank you, Jesus. And Bill would be all excited what God had done, and I'm going, oh, day, tomorrow it starts all over. <laughs> and we go through the process again. And finally, after 16 months, in tears, right over here, I knelt and said, Lord, I believe. I believe that this place, which was built in 1951, the year I was born, is here for a purpose. And you're going to provide for us because you want to do something special through this house. I trust you. And I'm no longer going to have anxiety. I'm no longer going to struggle wondering if I'm going to say you can. Because you can. And I've walked that way. And it's been so freeing. So freeing. Something breaks down, we pray over it. Sometimes God fixes it supernaturally. Sometimes we have to pay $1,000. But we got the $1,000 to pay. Yeah. But it had to do with this. How are you thinking? Do I trust God? You know, it wasn't that I didn't trust God. You know who I didn't trust? I didn't trust myself. I had to let go of my old ways and accept God's ways. You need to stop getting drunk, smoking, dope, and fornicating. You need to stop thinking he can't. Stop overeating, stop listening to worldly sexual music. The list can go on and on, and you know what you need to stop. Yeah. We all do. You know that if you're taking that candy bar and you're a diabetic, you shouldn't be doing that. You know if your doctor said, don't drink coffee, you don't drink coffee. We know this. You cannot become who the Father wants you to be without change. Changing is a choice to obey the Word of God. Change is a choice to quit sinning. Changing is putting off the old man and putting on the new. I'm choosing God's way over my way. Not my will to be done, but yours. I'm becoming a daughter of God with power. Yes. I'm becoming the head, not the tail, the lender, not the borrower. I'm becoming blessed in the city and blessed in the fields. Yep. I'm becoming the healed of the Lord. And I'm becoming more than a conqueror, and you can too. That's right. All of you. I'm not all the way there yet. I'm not where I want to be, but I sure am not where I used to be. Yeah. God will not make you serve him. God will not make you love him. God, God will not force you to spend time in his presence, and God will not force you to study his word. God will not force you into a relationship with him. Oh, does he love you? Oh, does he want you? Yes, but he's a gentleman. He doesn't go where he's not wanted. You must choose him. Yep. You must choose the anointing. You must choose his presence. You must choose to spend time studying his word and renewing your mind. If you're just getting what we're speaking on a Sunday, that's not enough. It's a daily fight. Yeah. His mercies are new every morning. Every morning. <clears throat> he gave you all this. Don't be like me and drag your feet. Finally relaxing in his arms. Finally believing everything he said is true. Grab it now. Choose to give him your all. Choose to renew your mind each day, for it's a lifelong process. But some of us 
can get further and faster than others because we choose each day. We are living in the greatest time to live for such a time as this, you pray with me. Yeah. Because we're here to change the world. We have seen what the world has done and become because we have not stood and let our sound roar. A roaring of who our God is. And we also read the end of the book, folks. We need to stand in victory. Yes. And look at that devil and say, hey, you got nothing over me. You're under my feet. Amen. And believe it. Yes. To stand strong. To go to places we've never been. And now I sound like Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I really believe that man was an anointed prophet when he wrote those stories. Because God wants us to go to places, to be a Gideon and cut, take down the enemy. You don't have to be the sharpest pencil in the box, but God's a good sharpener. He will get us there. Amen? Amen. I want you to listen to the song one more time. Hear it with your heart. And if there's something God's saying, this is what you need to change, agree with him and say, today, at this moment, this has got to go. It might be simply like opening up your Bible in the morning and reading the daily bread. It might be something like coming down to have a one coffee rather than six, like my husband had to do. It might be like me giving my whole way of eating, sitting when other people are eating and not eating. And you know what happened? I'm not resentful anymore. Because if I ate what you were eating, I'd be walking around like this with a walker, with a doctor telling me, Cheryl, if you don't change, you're going to die. You're going blind. Your heart and lung can't handle it. What's your choice? Choose life with God. Amen. I'm so glad you guys came today. Uh, we're here for you to minister to if you need ministering this moment. But I want you to take what my wife has shared with you seriously today. God has so much for you to become. To become so much more than you already are. Some of you have reached amazing heights. But he's got more. Don't limit what God wants to do in your life. But step out. But I will say this. As you step out, I want you to understand something. It can be very lonely. But I want to encourage you. I know when we accepted the, uh, the position of pastor, it, it can be very lonely at times. For those of you who are called to be an evangelist, it's a very lonely life. Prophets, it's a lonely life. Um, because a lot of times you're traveling alone. You're out there doing the work all by yourself. And so I just want to encourage you. You're never really alone. You always go with God. When you choose God, God chooses you. And he will be with you the whole way. You'll never really be alone. But you got to remember that. Because sometimes you feel alone. That's when you got to reach down inside and understand. The truth of the Bible, the truth of the Word of God, I'm right here. I will never leave you and never forsake you. So Father, as we go from this place, I ask, Lord God, that you reinforce your word, reinforce your promise to your children, to encourage them and to empower them to go higher, to go further, to become. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. And all his children said, Amen. Amen. Okay, go in peace. If you need any prayer or anything,